too much of it myself unless the, uh, the client involved has it as one of their major risks. It's really about, um, for them, it's about service level agreements. If they can't keep these agreements up and they can't keep their, uh, their people happy, their, their customers, their clients and so on, then they, you know, they, they worry about denial of service vulnerabilities. And we'll look at some of those uh, in a bit. Um, so we have uh, the interception and modification uh, aspect of it. So there's a number of different ways to do this, and this relates mainly to the, uh, the protocols like SIP and so on, which have uh, you know, registration that you can redirect and uh, take over calls. You can black hole them. You can reroute them to your own services. Uh, you can alter faxes, and you can alter conversations. So this is, uh, this is now the, uh, the, the meat of what we want to get at, at the moment, the, the, the entry point issue. Um, so... <laughs> VoIP, although the VoIP itself is not new, it does bring some issues to the IP network that uh, data, data administrators haven't had to deal with in the past. Um, you have to have a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of bandwidth for, for voice over IP systems. You have, to ha you have to keep these service levels up, you have to keep people happy, and you, you can't have some latency on the network, whereas with some of our services like web servers, a lot of that can be, can be tolerated. And uh, when I say it's as bad as email, I am clients and web browsers. Does, can, can anyone guess what, what I'm getting at with this? Anyone want to take a guess? Well, we've, uh, we've seen a lot of vulnerabilities in the past within email clients. You know, you've seen uh, the bugs that come out. Someone sends you a HTML file that has long set of strings in it or some sort of file access that they have you know, within the client because you have the web browsers built into your, uh, your Outlook and so on. And you also have things like Yahoo Instant Messenger where uh, malformed messages can, can exploit vulnerabilities in the box. And that became interesting to a lot of researchers over the past few years uh, as they moved away from looking at like web, uh, SMTP servers, uh, sent, you know, like SendMail, and then web servers like IIS and Apache. Stop, stop looking for so many bugs in them, start focusing more, more, focusing more on the client side. Now, if you have a voice over IP system, you're very likely to be introducing yet another client on your network, which will introduce more vulnerabilities that can be utilized by an attacker. So they may not be interested in your VoIP conversations, they may not want to eavesdrop on you, but they may want to execute, execute code on your box for you know, other purposes. So. The reason that uh, a lot of vulnerabilities are found within IM clients and so on is because these things deal with quite complicated protocols and complicated data formats, you know, uh, like HTML and uh, HTTP and SMTP and stuff. They, they, they've got, these protocols have got some simple characteristics, but there's so much that can go on within them that you have these uh, parsers that go through the data, and that's where vulnerabilities appear when people are trying to go through the data and check string lengths and they get it wrong and they introduce vulnerabilities into the software. And a lot of these bugs have been found, not only in the IM clients and so on, but in the soft phones themselves. So you, you're seeing a lot of vulnerabilities coming out at the moment in things like Skype. Skype was heavily attacked for a while. Um, it stood up to quite a bit of attack compared to some of the SIP clients, which uh, fall over if you just look at them the wrong way. Um, and more of these vulnerabilities are being found quite often. So. How do, we, how do we assess these systems? What, what do we do? How do we, uh, how do we look at this from a security point of view and, and figure out whether these systems are secure or find vulnerabilities in them or you know, set them up properly, deal with these issues that uh, we, we come across? So a couple of statements up there about um, how we look at VoIP. And we've covered these over the, uh, the past few slides that it's, it's not a new thing, it's not exciting, it's not it's not going to frighten us. We've dealt with these security issues in the past. We know how to deal with them. We just have to apply this logic to the voice over IP system. So the majority of research uh, has been focused on the implementations of these protocols and things like encryption and so on. And you can see that within the, the Black Hat track just now. You have... Uh, the ISEC guys earlier today, they're talking about protocols and how they're put together. And you have uh, Phil Zimmerman talking about uh, encryption options. So 
there's a lot of research being done in this, in this area, but these are not all the major threats within the, the VoIP network. And we can have a look at some of those just now, because like, like we, like we uh, discussed earlier, this is, where the this is where the attackers are looking. And if it's where the attackers are looking, it's where we should look as people who are assessing these systems for security or administrators who are trying to set these systems up security, securely in the first place. So, to, to deal with VoIP, the uh, simplest approach is to break it down into a number of components. And there's a few reasons behind that. It's multidiscipline. So, if you can break it down into components, you can task these different components to the people who understand them quite well. So if you want to look at the operating platform, you can get the guys who know about the operating systems and the network infrastructure to have a look at that. And then the configuration, you can get someone who knows about telephone systems and how they're put together and system policies and so on, which we'll look at shortly. And then you can look at the VoIP protocols, which is what everyone has been doing so far. And then you can look at support protocols like IP, uh, TCP, DNS, TFTP, and so on. Um, so operating platform. The, the voice over IP systems are they're not self-contained. They don't uh, you know, run on their own. They need uh, some, something around them. They need an operating platform. Some of them may run on their own hardware, but they will have you know, an embedded operating system in there. It may be a general purpose operating system like Linux, BSD, and Windows, and so on. But again, it may be custom built. So what you have to do is look at these operating systems in their own right as operating systems, not as VoIP boxes, but just as a system that runs on the box that we want to execute code on. And we want to look at the network infrastructure in the same way as a general network, network infrastructure security test, segregate it properly, set it up properly, defense in depth, all that sort of thing. Um, and then databases, web services, and uh, CRM solutions. Most, most voice over IP systems are put in to facilitate a lot of communication. And that communication often requires some sort of data tracking to go with it. So you will have these customer relationship management systems that tie into it, or you may have a database for call logging and so on, so that you can look back at uh, previous calling history. You can build clients based on call usage. Um, you can also look at the vulnerabilities within the VoIP software itself, using fuzzing techniques and vulnerabilities, vul vulnerability scanners and so on, um, which will give you some, some success to uh, a limited degree. So, when it comes to the configuration of voice over IP, this is the, uh, this is the point where you can't probe and parse. And I'll go through a, an example or two on this. Um, so we had a, we had a client, and we, we did an assessment on their voice over IP systems. And we didn't just want to look at the network infrastructure, infrastructure diagrams and how it was put together. We also wanted to look at the policies that they had in place. The, how the system was used, what was the business purpose behind it, so we can have a look at it. And one of the problems that we encountered was uh, when you dialed extension number 444, you would get through to this answering machine. Doesn't seem like a problem. The answering machine didn't give you any information when you called it, had nothing there, it just said, leave a message after the beep. So when we initially assessed the system, we just marked it on our spreadsheet as a, you know, an answering machine and didn't pay it too much attention. Now looking through the the policy information, they had this, uh, this procedure for having a, an employee removed you know, from the company. So you're a manager, and you've decided to sack this guy for uh, not securing your voice over IP system properly. And what you do is you call this number up, and you leave the guy's name and his employee number, which are written on his badge. So what happens there is this goes straight to IT which I thought was a pretty good process. You know, most companies, it's not that you know, streamlined. You, you won't get um, IT find out the guy left about six months later when uh, he's using the account to steal the database. Um, so IT get the information, and they lock the guy's accounts to all of the systems. And you, know, you can't log in to databases. You can't authenticate to the network and so on. They then pass that information on to building security, who will then lock the guy out of the building because they'll cancel the security card. And those guys, it's their responsibility to then ha pass that information on to HR, who will then stop the guy's pay. So, you know, the vulnerability there is that you could just phone up this number and really mess someone's life up for a month or two by locking them out of the system and not getting them paid and so on. They'll probably get back into the system within a couple of days, but getting salary sorted out can take a long time. 
um, especially in a large organization. So to, to combat these issues, you, can't, you, can't, you just can't scan for that. There's no, no vulnerability scanner is going to pick that up because it doesn't know it hasn't read the policy. And even if it did read the policy, it wouldn't understand it. Um, which is why looking at the network and uh, assessing the VoIP software that's there, you have to look at more than just what's installed, how it's configured and what it does. You have to look more in depth at how it's used and what these people actually do with these systems. And a good technique for doing this is to flowchart um, call dialing plans and uh, IVR menu systems and so on. When you do that, you can see who, who has access to, to which telephone numbers. So when we did this, and we knew this guy, this guy could phone 444 as an attacker from anywhere in the company, the simple solution was to make that extension A, unavailable to that guy from the phones that he's, he has access to and his login details and so on, and also to put some sort of pin protection or password on there as well, which makes it much harder for an attacker to uh, have someone sacked. Um, so, what do you look for in these configurations? Um, default passwords. It's unbelievable that default passwords are such a major issue in voice over IP systems, but about 80% of the systems that I scan and I look at and I assess have some sort of default password issue. It may not be the management interface, it may not be the direct demo system access interface, but you will have uh, SIP accounts and so on that have default passwords built into them. And then you have the uh, bad dial plan logic. Uh, different VoIP vendors have their own terminology for dial plans, call flow, and so on. But basically, who can call who? At what times of the day? Who, who can call in? What can uh, international callers do? Can, can the receptionist call out internationally? Can she call long distance? Can she call local, and so on? Um, you also have uh, call control and monitoring systems. Uh, any decent voice over IP system will have some sort of feature for recording calls and for forwarding calls and so on. So you can, you can abuse these. Uh, an example of that being in the UK, to dial uh, an international number, we would prefix the number with 00, zero and then the dialing code and we dial the number. And generally to get an outside line on a voice over IP, uh, sorry, on any telephone network, you would hit 9 or or zero, but commonly a nine. So can, a, can an attacker call in from some local number, call up the receptionist and say, hi, my name's, uh, my name's Tom, I'm the engineer, I'm having a look at the system, I need you to drop me into the test line. Can you transfer me to extension number 900? Does anyone see the problem with that? <laughs> so she drops you right into 900 and you're sitting there with, with a, you know, a pre dialed line and you can finish off the international call. And again, you can commit toll fraud and we come back to the threats and the, the methods for, for, uh, for accomplishing this. Um, you also have the accounting and billing systems, which relates to uh, the uh, databases and stuff that we'll have in the background. So you may have an Oracle database or a MS SQL database, which holds information about the calls that were, that were made. And you can look at these in the same way that you look at any database system. You can scan it for vulnerabilities using the tools that you have. You can look at the configuration and so on. You can find the SQL injection problems that, that are in the interfaces with them. Um, so the VoIP protocols themselves. Um, like I said, we're not focusing on this terribly much because I think it's been done to death and I don't think it covers the issues that people face.